thank you for joining us for another episode of The Real Conversation. This is our Law & Order edition, part two. My name is Lodima Mpoko, and joining me today will be a prosecuting attorney for Richland County, Gary Bishop. And later on, we will be sitting down with Lori Cope, who happens to be the Director of Safety and Service for the City of Mansfield. Let's take a look. Joining us is Richland County Prosecutor Gary Bishop, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the current events going on and how that weighs into the prosecu prosecutorial process um, so we can learn a bit more. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Um, so, Mr. Bishop, may I call you Prosecutor Bishop or Gary? Oh, or? Gary's fine. Okay, Gary, thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to become our prosecutor. I uh, have been a licensed attorney since 1987. Mm -hmm. um, I started out at uh, Bowling Green State University, graduated there with a political science degree, uh, went to the University of Toledo College of Law and graduated from that with a jurisprudence doctorate, and uh, became licensed in 1987. Uh, almost immediately began work in the uh, prosecutor's office in Wood County. Uh, then, a, then prosecuting attorney Betty Montgomery, who was of course later our attorney general and so forth, um, hired me and I spent 19 years there before coming to Richland County in 2005. I did a, a year and a half of uh, service to the citizens of Ashland County uh, during 2014-2015 era uh, and ran for election in 2016 and been serving as Richland County prosecutor since 2017. A very interesting time we live in, but I think we can safely say that tides are shifting in a lot of ways um, for the first time, earnestly, maybe since 92 when, or the 90s when we got the major overhaul for criminal justice. We've had earnest conversations about change and things we need to fix and tweak. But fast forward to 2020, the conversation is how can we scale some of those things back because there seems to be a bit of an overburden on the side of the citizens and both the side of law enforcement. Um, so I guess that takes us to the conversation of current events. Um, and I wanted to see, ask if you could just walk us through the process a little bit about what happens when someone is, um, how is someone charged with a crime? Where does it go from initial arrest or investigation? How does it get to your hands a case? There are a number of different scenarios of course. A person can be arrested either because a police officer witnesses a crime being committed or an officer responds to a call and determines that based on the evidence there's probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed mm -hmm. and so they can affect an arrest and take that person into custody. Uh, other times when there's a crime alleged, there has to be an investigation. Mm -hmm. No arrest is immediately made and oftentimes those cases are referred to us for review. Mm -hmm. Once we've reviewed the case and determined that there is sufficient evidence, we can either file a complaint or we can go to the grand jury and seek an indictment. Now in the case I think you're most interested in, um, a person is arrested. Mm -hmm. they're, they're taken to jail. A complaint has to be filed and that complaint can be either be a misdemeanor, in which case my office doesn't primarily handle that, mm -hmm. or the cases that we see where a complaint for a felony has been filed. Mm -hmm. That person then has a right to, of course, go before a judge or magistrate uh, and have a bond established for them. They have a right to have a preliminary hearing. If they're in jail, they have a right to have that hearing within 10 days. Mm -hmm. If they're not in jail, they're allowed to have that, or entitled to have that hearing within 15 days. And of course, there are provisions in the law that require that we count those days in custody as three. So every day a person sits in jail for purposes of our speedy trial statute counts as three days. Interesting. So we, we have to move fast and historically, a preliminary hearing is actually a constitutional safeguard mm -hmm. so that the government can't simply go around arresting people and putting them in jail for no reason. So within 10 days we have to come to court and put on evidence and testimony to demonstrate that it's at least probable that that person committed the offense and that they're the person who committed it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a probable cause determination. Okay. So in the instance of, we're, we're referring to a case that happened in Garfield Heights Cleveland, 
where a gentleman was arrested. Um, it's a bit unclear why from the information that I have right now. But a gentleman was arrested, um, put in jail, went before a magistrate. The bail was set at $250,000 to which he could not pay. Um, and at some point he spent five months in jail, ultimately to have the charges dropped. A $250,000 bond would make one think that it was a felony, um, but I haven't been able to confirm that. The rest, I think, is somewhat of an aberration. I don't myself understand how that happened. Um, based on the information I have, it would appear that uh, there was a lapse. Uh, this individual, of course, had to, his case had to have been seen by a judge or magistrate in order for that bond to be instituted. Mm -hmm. And once that bond was instituted and he, he was in jail, certainly if he was charged with a felony, he had a right to a preliminary hearing. Uh, if he was charged with a misdemeanor, he had a right to have an arraignment and have a trial set within a much shorter time period than five months. Mm -hmm. So I think that case probably is somewhat of a, somebody dropped the ball, it seems like. Um, which leads to the next question. When um, someone turns out to be innocent or the charges are dropped or mm -hmm. they're just innocent, um, is there any recourse or redress for the time that they have spent locked away? There can be. Again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly have cases where we charge someone with a crime or we indict them for a crime, um, bond is set, they're in jail, and then things that are beyond our control happen. The victim dies or the victim comes out and recants and says, I'm taking it all back. I, I made it all up, and those are instances where we couldn't foresee that. Mm -hmm. um, and so certainly uh, we're not going to face a civil suit or, or liability for something that was beyond our control. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if, it is cert if it's demonstrated that these were unfounded charges, that there was no basis for these in the first place, that this person was wrongly accused or wrongly convicted, if evidence was withheld, those type of things certainly open up uh, the prospects for civil liability. There's this fear that men have to carry, particularly black men, that if their significant other gets upset with them or for whatever reason they have this power where they can call law enforcement and say, I was raped, I was beaten, come and take him away. So where's the balance for um, that fear when there's, when it's, hard to prove. I know with rape there's test kits, but they may not always be as revealing as they need to be. And a lot of times with the culture of women fighting for their rights as well, and how hard it was for victims of rape to find recourse over the years, um, and the legislative overhaul that had to occur for, you know, what we talked about a bit earlier with the free test kits and just being able to advocate for themselves and having an establishment that particularly advocates for this particular issue. So where's the balance between these two extremes? Men who are, um, who face these types of ac accusations and may have their lives disrupted only to, for things to be, go back to normal after that accusation has either been withdrawn or it's maybe proven that they're innocent and assisting victims of crime without, and weeding out the non-innocent on both sides of that coin? First of all, in that arena of domestic violence, and, and whether it applies to individuals that are, are black or white or, or any other race, we could spend all day talking about domestic violence all by itself. Yes. But <laughs> to move on to and try to answer your question, what the legislature did meant several years ago was implement a mandatory arrest policy on domestic violence. And mandatory arrest, uh, don't get the wrong impression when we say mandatory arrest. What that law requires is that if an officer responds to a domestic violence call mm -hmm. and there's a complaint of domestic violence and there's visible, evident physical injury, mm -hmm. then they're mandated to make an arrest. Absent that, if they determine not to make an arrest, they are required to detail in their report why they chose not to make an arrest. So there 
is that dichotomy uh, and that, that objective, I guess, criteria at the outset. Now, the gentleman who is um, afraid uh, he's going to be falsely accused. Mm -hmm. uh, or has been. In some or has history. been. Mm -hmm. uh, a simple argument, nothing illegal, and she gets mad and she's calling the police. First, they're going to come and see what the complaint is, and they're, they're going to ask for details. They're going to do an, a quick interview, at least, to determine, does this legally constitute domestic violence? In other words, if what you're saying is true, is that a violation? We have a lot of situations where the alleged offender has fled the residence mm -hmm. and is not present at the scene. Um, we encourage our local law enforcement, when they do find that person, whether it's later that evening or three days later or a week later to at least to offer them the opportunity to, to give their side of the story, which of course they're not required to do, but we'd like to extend that opportunity. So there's an, a, a constant assessment process going on. We do have charges of falsification. We, we certainly have charges for perjury, falsification, obstructing official business. And unfortunately, there have been in, in my career times when I've had to use those statutes to charge people who've made false accusations. It happens. And, and we have, unfortunately, uh, and we, we kind of get criticized from both sides. Uh, the victim advocate agencies say, oh, don't, don't arrest the victim, don't charge right. her. Well, First, let's define victim. Right. Uh, that's someone who's who's been harmed by another, not someone who made a false accusation. Right. So we've, we've had to do that. There are many nuances to the criminal procedure process. The trial, a jury trial being the biggest piece. Um, so for Richland County, during a criminal proceeding, how many jurors do we have? And what is the... Um, what is the jury's role in the court process? And how do we come to put together the jury that handles a particular case? Well, first of all, in, in felony matters, a jury is comprised of 12 citizens. So, and the verdict, of course, has to be unanimous. Mm -hmm. So if we convince 11 out of 12, we lose. Uh, it has to be unanimous. Jury selection is kind of a misnomer, I always like to say. And what we're really doing is, is exercising challenges to that array of jurors. And, and instead of saying, I want this one, I want this one, I want this one, we're saying, I don't want that one, I don't <laughs> want that one. And as you can imagine, we're getting, trying to eliminate those people that we think are biased, prejudiced, unfair, you know, uh, not of a, a, of a fair-minded demeanor and so forth. Uh, and we're also, um, you know, looking for those jurors who are law-abiding, who, who believe in our laws, who believe in our criminal justice system, who aren't going to engage in jury nullification, those types of issues. And, and I don't say this in a derogatory way, but the defense attorneys are exercising peremptory challenges and they're trying to eliminate the ones we want. Right. And we're trying to eliminate the ones they would want. Mm -hmm. And so what we end up with is what's left. So it's a it's a quite a bit of a complicated process. And uh, in the end it's uh, I don't want to say it's a crapshoot, um, but th there's only so much you can do to determine whether you have a fair and impartial jury. What are the benefits of having a diverse jury, especially if the defendant is from, is black, for instance? What, why is it important to have black jurors? The number one reason for that, the importance of that diversity is reliability in the outcome, trust in the outcome. We, our whole system of justice is based on, we need to trust our outcomes. We need to know that our, our convictions in particular have integrity, mm -hmm. but also our acquittals. Not everyone can be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. In other words, nobody wins every case. Right. Mm -hmm. 
But either way, guilty or not guilty, we need to have trust in the outcome. We need to have confidence in our process and in, our, in the result it obtains. Mm -hmm. And so to have that diversity is clearly one of those layers that we have to have in place so that the public can trust our system. Thank you for coming down and speaking with us today for this second part of the Real Conversation, the Law and Order Edition. After a quick break, we will be sitting down with the Safety Service Director for the City of Mansfield, Lori Cope. The Real Conversation is presented by NECIC and the Ally Initiative, Black Belt Pro Fitness, Tritico Sign Company, Lowe's, do it right for less, Ohio Drone Perspective, and BS Media Productions. North Central Ohio's video production headquarters. Welcome back. Joining us is Lori Cope, the Safety Service Director for the City of Mansfield. And we're going to continue our Law and Order conversation and get more perspective from one of our top officials uh, for law enforcement in the city. So, Lori, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today? Thank you. Um, well, I started in law enforcement in 93 here in this city as a park police officer and then transferred, um, taking the test, the civil service test to become an officer for the city of Mansfield. Mm -hmm. And um, was there until I was in a bad cruiser accident in 03 mm -hmm. and took some time off to um, recover for that. And then when Mayor Thaker um, ran his campaign and took office, he um, elected or appointed me to this position of safety director. And you are the first woman to hold your position? To my knowledge, yes ma'am. <laughs> no matter how far back we go. And yes. how's that been for you as being a woman on the police force? Um, it was different. At first I was going to Ashland University to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I saw the billboard scene, a civil service test for police. And for some reason I thought, I want to take that test and see you know, how, that, how that goes. I was drawn to that. So I took the test, um, finished second at the time, but I was pregnant with my daughter. So I had her and two years later took it and finished first on the test. So I thought there's something innate in me that draws me to this. And I fell in love with it and felt like it's my life's calling at the time. Um, there were only, I think, five maybe females on the Department of 100 males. Oh, wow. But you, I can tell you when I first got hired, they said, as long as you, if we're fighting, you're fighting. You know, if we're if we're out there and you're next to us doing it, um, you will fit in. And, and that's exactly how it worked. It was um, if I could hold my own 30 seconds, they're coming. Same for them. They know I'm coming. Mm -hmm. So it it really was um, a wonderful experience. I would I would not trade it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So as safety service director. Mm -hmm. What are your duties with the force or with the city? 
basically this position is I'm responsible for um, those that are in charge of mm -hmm. police, fire, and 911 primarily. And it's about half our employees for the city are under those three um, departments. Police, fire, and 911? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, so that covers hiring, firing? Yes, ma'am. Disciplines. Um, disciplines, et cetera. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So there's been a lot of discussion around what we can do locally as a response to some of the things that we see nationally um, and the reoccurring theme of police misconduct and relations between police and community, mm -hmm. um, particularly what's been happening or what happened to George Floyd and the chokehold involving the knee. Mm -hmm. um, so locally there has been discussion about our police review commission and how that works. Could you tell us a little bit about how our local protocol works with the, our Police Review Commission? Sure. And what that does for the community here? Sure. That um, commission is basically under um, the umbrella of City Council. So each ward appoints a person to sit on the commission from their particular ward. And then they are, I think they meet every other month and basically have um, if there's a complaint that comes in from a citizen on a police um, activity or police behavior of some sort and it has to go through the criminal process so say you make an arrest and that person has a process that he's due to he or she is due to go through and once that criminal process is done then it goes to the Commission to say has the investigation been completed thoroughly there's three steps that we that we um, require or that is required by legislation that the that the investigation is thorough and accurate and complete those three steps and if the Commission determines those three things then they're able to I guess uh, sign off so to speak on it they don't have a responsibility um, to really affect the outcome of any sort they just want to know an overseer of was this investigation handled properly in those three those three type items Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and for the investigation piece, who handles that part? That would come in to the chief and then be assigned to one of his detectives. We don't have an, an IA department, but he'll assign it to a detective and they do all the research on it. Pull the tapes if we have any videotapes, pull statements from both the officer and the um, suspect and um, handle it that way. Again, once the legal issue of it is complete in the courts, then that'll begin. Has the uh, review commission been pretty effective thus far? Um, I feel it has. It really opens the door basically for the for transparency. So the um, community is able to know that this group of people oversee has the investigation been handled properly? Was it handled fairly? Was it accurate? Um, it really gives gives the community someone to look for to say I know they they're watching for this and and for the officers as well so it's just an over overseer of the of the process so it, we haven't had many complaints they made a few recommendations with the, which they're certainly able to do mm -hmm. either to the mayor or the police chief or, or both and mm -hmm. then we would take that into account if we make some changes but it's been effective because again it's transparency and that's what the community wants and expects and deserves. All right, okay. So if if the council does find that there is a breakdown in the system, they mm -hmm. are free to make recommendations. Well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yeah. is there a follow up to that once they have made recommendations? Do you guys like go back to the commission and say, Hey, this is what our corrective action or Yes, what's been determined and here's why, and yes, it's, it's very open and, they're, and council members are able to sit in, their community is able to sit in and, and view those meetings, so it's very oh. helpful in that way. That's, I think that's important to know that yeah. the community is able to sit in on these hearings yes. as they occur. Mm -hmm. And these meeting, meetings, do they take place um, at City Hall? They do, it in council chambers. Mm -hmm. Okay, are they scheduled? Um, Every other month. As long as there's a, they will send it through um, if there's no topics or no say, um, issues to address, they'll, they'll cancel and reschedule. And so it, it doesn't happen consistently every other month because things are pretty smooth going. Mm -hmm. But if there is something to address, it's every other month. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, during our last episode, we included mm -hmm. clips from the community to ask them how they felt their relationship with the community or with law enforcement was. Mm -hmm. And some of the feedback was that they were, there was still so much trust mm -hmm. um, between the community and law enforcement. And there were even instances where the guys um, wanted to talk to people who were actually afraid to come on camera mm -hmm. um, because they didn't want to get in trouble with law enforcement for speaking out later. Oh, wow. Um, so I guess it's safe to say that um, there are people who are afraid to even file a complaint with the Review Commission. Mm -hmm. And so um, obviously we want to hear from those folks so that we know if right. there's an officer on the force behaving badly when mm -hmm. no one can see. Right. Um, and so my question would be, what do we tell the folks who are afraid to speak out but who are experiencing things locally that they may want to um, that should be addressed. Well, I can say for me is I welcome those calls and I get those calls where they say, we have a concern about an officer. I ask, I ask for facts, you know, mm -hmm. give me the time and date, where they were, where you were and what happened. I would address that right away with the police chief and he takes it from there and they even are welcome to come back and do come back to me either come in on station or call and say where are we in this process and I'll update them but we want to know those things because the community is the eyes and ears for us right. we can't be everywhere and can't see everything mm -hmm. and I have those complaints as low as um, at the lowest level to say, you know, officer so-and-so isn't wearing a seatbelt on this date, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, I get, I get all those. Or maybe they, they swore, or maybe they ran a red light. There's a lot of things that really just educating the public on here's what was happening, and them having an ear, they, they want to be heard. And so I welcome that, and I can't, um, I can't say that enough that we welcome that. We as a state must do all that we can to ensure that all of our police officers, regardless of whether they serve in a big city, a suburb, small village, have the knowledge and skills to properly protect the public. I've never met a law enforcement officer who did not want more training. Two days ago, DeWine, you know, there was the DeWine thing, the executive order, mm -hmm. and then um, Tim Scott came out with this thing, mm -hmm. and then today, the Democrats came out with their police reform bill. Have you been keeping up with those at all? I have somewhat. I just listened to Tim Scott last night. Um, He's a Republican out of uh, South Carolina, mm -hmm. yes, and listening to him, I was a little disappointed to see that that bill had been turned down because we were, well, I have both um, President Trump's executive order and DeWine's executive order, and I'm happy to report mm -hmm. that it, it really does uh, coincide with our code of conduct and what we have, and we have a little things to tweak. We're very pleased to know that there's grant funding that they're looking at giving for, say, body cams and things like that, mm -hmm. which is, which is, um, is certainly going to be a, a, a help to both the community and the police. Mm -hmm. It is it is something that we're really excited about and have actually applied for a grant for that. Mm -hmm. It won't cover uh, body cams for all our officers, but it's like a kiosk kiosk program where there's you know say 20 body cams and you come to work and grab this one and take it out and then we download it into the cloud and mm -hmm. then it erases and then we go to the next one and we're able to use those we would love to um, apply for those and so that's what we're looking for and have applied and are waiting to hear so so there's been a lot of talk about defunding the police mm -hmm. or abolishing the police altogether which are two very different conversations mm -hmm. you know abolishing the police is get, getting rid of them altogether whereas defunding the police is a mix of taking funding away from certain programs like SWAT teams, mm -hmm. um, militarized gear, things like that, and reshuffling those funds somewhere else, either mm -hmm. within the department or outside of the department. And it also is taking away some responsibility that have been befallen on local law enforcement across the country, mm -hmm. like handling mental health crisis uh, mm -hmm. instances um, and things that should be taken care of more so by a social worker. 
Um, so when you or your comrades on the force hear things like defunding the police and even abolishing the police, how does that make you guys feel? How does that make you feel? Oh, I, I'm quite shocked by the conversation really at all. Mm -hmm. I, but, you know, understanding from where I come from, and I think that uh, I, can't, I can't think that it would even make any sense. Um, I know that the conversation locally has been defunding. Well, we don't really mean defunding. What we mean is reducing, like you said, um, taking funding and put, taking it from here and putting it elsewhere, maybe reducing the funding. But I can tell you that we, uh, I mean, we need uh, more funding. Mm -hmm. we, I, I can't imagine that. Um, we would love to say social workers handle this particular incident, say mental health, for example. So we work with them and we all our officers are trained in that. We all, they all take the CIT training and work with NAMI. As soon as they get hired, they go through the training. Then we have an annual research to mm -hmm. say, here's the best practice. Of course, it's ever growing and new instances come up that they, but they retrain every year in order to deal with that. Um, it's not, in my opinion, it's not safe for a social worker to go into a situation that is a known mental health situation on their own. They absolutely would need the protection of the police. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes, then there's another person in, in there that the police have to look out for and, and make sure it's safe, not only the, the mental health person becoming a victim, but also the social worker. Mm -hmm. So while we're trained in that, um, it, and and, and deal with that on, really on a daily basis. I think defunding is, we would see so many um, good programs go to the wayside. We work with the community in so many ways. I, I can't think, I, I really can't think Mansfield would ever be a fan, be fans of defunding. I think it's more about um, continuing what we're doing, continuing these meetings and these talks and, and and all that comes from that is so beneficial that defunding, I, I can't think would make sense. <laughs> I, we need more funding. We need more funding. More funding. <laughs> more police, more <laughs> fire, more funding. Um, yeah. One thing, too, that the bill calls for, the one that is in the Democratic proposal that okay. is actually not addressed in the one presented by Tim Scott, which was surprising, and it's the issue of racial profiling. Do you... Okay. Um, the Democratic one is calling for a complete ban of it. Um, how do you feel about that? I really think that it is um, very comparable to the topic of race ish, racism on its own. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think racial profiling is a mindset. It's a behavior. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you're looking for something, then that's probably what you're going to find. Right. You know, if you're, if, if you're just getting an overall picture, I think I don't see that here. And, and of course, we obviously, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't accept that here right, if we yeah. see it. But um, if there's specific, specific situations where someone says, I think that was racial profiling, then I would feel more comfortable addressing it in that manner. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that I think it's a mindset. I don't think it's a, I don't think you could say we don't allow it. Right. Okay, you don't allow it. That's good to know. Right. It, there's, there's no teeth behind that and there's no, you could say it's a rule and then it becomes a law that you don't allow it, which we don't allow racial profiling. Right. But I don't know. I think it's more of a mindset and more of training and more of educating, mm -hmm. um, understanding cultures. I think it's much more that than, than a hard and fast no, no to it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you have uh, an officer that joins the force that comes from a very uh, homogenous area and comes to a city like Mansfield or somewhere similar that has a very diverse population mm -hmm. and maybe a bit more urban than there in terms of like the geographic layout, maybe a bit different. So how do you acclimate a new officer who may be from a more homogenous background coming into a city like Mansfield or placing them somewhere like Cleveland or Columbus where it's demographically diverse. How do you get them ready? Um, really just through our FTO program, our field training officer that they're with as soon as they come in and we, they spend one month with three different officers mm -hmm. and, and patrolling all the areas clear to the south end, all the way to the north end and involving them in schools, involving them in the community, in the friendly house and, and uh, downtown and 
getting them acclimated with what it means to be in Mansfield. And then they, and, and of course we have um, males, females, blacks and whites on our department. So it helps too to, to get their view as uh, internally as well. So I think it's all through the training again and educating. Mm -hmm. Do you think we would stand for more um, funding for training in those areas in particular? Right, we definitely would. Um, we we think the biggest the biggest impact we have is training and and um, both internal and external. We are under Calia. We're Calia certified, which is eight hundred departments out of twelve thousand mm -hmm. are 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 get that certification, and that tells us there's an outside agency that has rules, and we have to comply by it, and they make sure that we do, or we're not certified. It helps with the grants, funding, and things like that. So all that is addressed in that. It's basically an overseer of the department and its rules and policies, and we abide by those. Thank you so much for joining us today for this segment of the Law & Order edition of The Real Conversation. We'll be back after a short break. The Real Conversation is presented by NECIC and the Ally Initiative, Black Belt Pro Fitness, Critico Sign Company, Lowe's, do it right for less, Ohio Drone Perspective, and BS Media Productions, North Central Ohio's video production headquarters. Thank you for joining us for another edition of The Real Conversation and a special thank you to our guests, Gary Bishop and Lori Coates. Join us next week, same time, same place, 8 o'clock Thursday. Next week we will be enjoying a battle of the sexes where we will have both men and women discussing some of the hottest topics today. Thank you.